morning and welcome to the Outbreak First Church of the Nazarene. It is so good to see you guys here today. And it's very good for to see you joining online for those who can see them joining online on their phones. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start off our worship this morning by reading Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. The word of the Lord. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. For you, Lord, created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Will you please stand up and join us as we worship our wonderful Lord this morning.
10 through 18. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expedited by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli of the vision he had. But Eli called and Samuel said, or called to Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. Eli, Samuel said, Here I am. Eli said, What is it that he told you? Don't hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Okay. Well, good morning. I can probably, probably shorten up the bumper video. I don't have to walk that far. So I'm supposed to create a smooth transition, not awkward pauses. So um, we'll figure it out. Um, if, uh, if you ever want to kind of play a, a fun game, um, Again, I'm a nerd, so let me qualify fun here. Um, the scriptures that we, we read most Sunday mornings, not everyone, but most Sunday mornings, um, you know, a few weeks ago I shared about the church calendar. There's um, some very wise people, and very smart people, that put together a, a series of scriptures that go along with that calendar. It's called the, the lectionary. You familiar with the lectionary? You've heard of this before, maybe? You know some. Um, and so each week, these smart and uh, wise people uh, have presented pastors and church leaders all over the globe scriptures that move into that those seasons of the church calendar, but are also somewhat connected. And so we, well, I'll, I'll preach from only one of those texts most Sundays. Um, the, the psalm that Hannah has been sharing with us, and the scripture that uh, you know, Tabitha read this morning, came from that lecturing. So here's the, here's the fun part of the fun game, is some wise and smart and very spiritual people have said these scriptures go together. Um, so if you're sitting there listening to, to have to talk about Eli, and then listening to the, the, the psalm um, that Ham shared, and then the scripture that I'm going to share, like, somebody said these things are connected, and uh, some weeks they're, they're not all that obvious, so, that are. so that's a fun game, right? That's fun, right? Um, connect the dots, I guess. But yeah, so we're in our uh, third week, if I'm counting correctly, in the uh, Seeing Jesus, Seeing God sermon series, which is our epiphany series. God uh, is revealed through Jesus, right? So Jesus shows up at Christmas time, there's the baby Jesus, and then epiphany is, well, okay, so what does Jesus show us? Who is this Jesus? What does he teach us? Have you met and encountered Jesus? What, what, do, we, what do we learn from this? Who do we become because of this? So each week during this series, we're asking a question uh, about what Jesus shows us about who God is. Last week was, where is God? You were with us last week, you joined online. You remember that we talked about Jesus being baptized in the wilderness and hearing the voice of God and seeing the Holy Spirit descend. That God's out in the wilderness. And that was a, a big deal um, for people that were convinced that God's presence was in a very secure place inside the temple. This week we ask a similar question, but it'll be a, a lot different. The question is, where is God from? So last week was, where is God? This week is, where is God from? Um, and to answer that, to answer that question, um, I want to first just kind of point our attention to the popularity of comic book superheroes. Does anybody like superheroes? I've got a few. Uh, it's been a, yeah, all right. We've got, in, in popular culture, you know, you go back to my childhood, comic book superheroes were kind of, a, again, a nerdy thing. That, maybe that's the theme for today, nerdy. Um, <laughs> but in the last decade or so, um, these comic book characters have dominated the movie screens and TV screens.
dreams have become the popular uh, story to tell. And there's good reasons for, for why some of these comic book superheroes are so popular and more mainstream than ever. But people that are big fans, they, they like the stories and stuff, but they really get caught up in the origin stories. You feel familiar with that phrase, origin story? So they'll do a movie that like uh, shows the superhero doing whatever the superhero does, but then at some point they're like, we need to know where this guy came from. We want to see how he became or how she became the superhero that, that came about. And so they do the origin story, and people get all excited like, to hear the story of where this person came from. And, and the reality is that these superheroes have the ability to change the world, are either born with that ability, because they've come from someplace else, right? they, they, they are come from places that have extraordinary circumstances, or that create in them that ability. For example, you know, Superman was born on another planet, and so um, they had a different sense of gravity, which is why he can fly. Or something. Like, the logic breaks down at some point, but, but there's always a sense of they came from someplace else, they were just born great, or something tragic happened to them, something major happened to them that forced this ability on them. Right? So you're either born with it, or something happens to you um, to make it great. Now, the, the exceptions to this in the superhero realm would probably be like Iron Man and Batman, who uh, basically their superpower is lots of money, and they can do things with lots of money, and they're, they're smart. Um, but for the most part, the superheroes are born great, or they have greatness kind of given to them, or forced upon them. You don't see a whole lot of rags to riches stories in the superhero uh, realm, these people that could shape the world. Now, the reason I'm talking about superheroes is because in the context of Jesus' day, um, there wasn't a whole lot of upward mobility in culture. Right? So the people that ruled the world in Jesus' day, the people that had power in Jesus' day, the people that could shape what life was like in the ancient world were either born with it, they were born into ruling families and ruling classes, or it was somehow given to them through through wars or, or treaties or something like that. They didn't. There was not not the sense that we have in the American dream, where you, you start out with nothing and you work your way up through the, the ladder and you suddenly accomplish success. That type of rags to riches story didn't exist in the day of Jesus. So great things came from great things. Powerful people came from. Powerful families. And that's just the way that the world works. You pretty much were born with your identity. You became who your parents were. Upward mobility wasn't a virtue or a value in the ancient world. And so there were these centers of power, these, these places, these hubs in the world that, that generated the next uh, class of rulers that made sure the, the powerful and the the, the wealthy and the world shapers kind of stayed in that realm. And then there's these places that we've never heard of because they were historically insignificant, far off the beaten path. They were people that, that lived in these places were also viewed as insignificant, powerless, didn't contribute a whole lot to the world, couldn't shape the world, couldn't change the world, couldn't, didn't have a whole lot to contribute. When, when Jessica and I were, were first married, we lived in kind of such a place. <laughs> we lived in a place called Kempton, Illinois. And Jessica was a school teacher there. Um, there was a school district that had a, a building there, and that's where Jessica taught. And there was a post office, a bank, that was robbed twice in the four years that we lived there. Um, and then, what was, the, what was the, the weird place with the pyramid? It was like some sort of shop that, like, tourists, like, it was bizarre. So in this middle, the middle of nowhere Illinois farm town that was like two streets, no stoplights, it didn't even have stop signs, honestly. Um, there was this weird spiritual shop thing. Yeah, you could get pyramids and third eyes and stuff there. Right? It was really bizarre. But that was the whole town. Like no, no grocery stores, no gas stations. Um, the school that she taught at, like it was weird. The playground was right next to the cemetery, which I thought, as a teacher, <laughs> Could have been a really motivating tool. Um, stop what you're doing, or you know, point to the kind of, uh, It was it was a strange place, but like nobody went there when, I, when we got married. Just already uh, lived there, and said, so "This is where I'm living." They're like, where? Um, it was out of the way. You didn't go.
go there unless you, you knew somebody who was there. And even then, you try to get them to come to you because you didn't want to go to um, and, and so for our story today, in a, in a moment we're going to read a scripture that talks about Jesus being from Nazareth. And so I want you to, I mean, as I'm describing Kempton, maybe you've been to a place. Maybe there's places around here that I'm not familiar with yet, but I'm still too new. I haven't gone driving back roads to find old towns. Um, but maybe there's a place that that story reminds you of. And that's kind of what Nazareth is here. So when we read the scripture, uh, keep in mind, Nazareth is this place that's not a place of power. Great people don't come from here. Right? I don't want to get too many details because it'll ruin the story, but... Um, keep in mind that's what, what Nazareth is about. All right, so our scripture for this morning is John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. John 1, 43 through 51. It says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, or said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathaniel replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Pray with me, Joel. Father, we ask this morning that you would take your word and take it off the pages of our Bibles and bring them to life with your spirit and speak to our hearts and speak to our minds so that we may know you more. As we look at the story of Jesus, may we see Jesus revealing you. And may it not only give us information about you and speak truth about who you are, but may it invite us to be more like you, to depend more on your spirit, and to, to look through the lens that Jesus looked through rather than the lens of this world. We thank you and love you. Amen. So this is a, this, this story, a scripture story here in John, is a, is a fun one. Like, there's a lot of things... You could, you could pull out of this story. Um, you could look at how when uh, Jesus called Philip, Philip ran and told Nathaniel about Jesus. So like this could be an evangelism or sharing your story or sharing your faith sermon. Um, and I think it would have been a good, a good message. Um, we have part of the story where, where Jesus told uh, Nathaniel he saw him before Philip called him. And because of that, because of, of that revelation of who, you know, Jesus' abilities and who he was, Nathaniel confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. And that would have been a good one. Like, how do we see God doing stuff? How do we see Jesus in our lives? And how do we acknowledge who he is? That could have been a good, a good sermon, uh, I think. Uh, Jesus and Nathaniel talk about a miraculous thing that happened. And Jesus says, greater things you will see than this. So that could be a good message about the promises of what God's going to do in the future, the promises that, that God did through Jesus after this story happened. Could be a really good message, I think. But um, and honestly, I, I've really always just been curious about the whole Nathaniel's response to the discussion of the fig tree. Like that's just always like so. It, it's always seemed a bit over the top to me. So you know, Jesus says, "I saw you under a fig tree," and his response is. You're the king of Israel! Like, that seems a little over dramatic in Nathaniel, like, what's going on here? So that could have been fun to just try and figure that out and explore it. Um, I don't know how you, you make that connection, right? Like, there's something going on here deeper. But this week we're asking the question, where, does, where did God come from? Or where is God from? That's a weird question, right? Because we know God is spirit and God's everywhere. Or God's, you know, in heaven or that type of thing. Um, 
But I wanted to ask that question specifically because I want to talk about who we are as a church. Philip tells Nathaniel that he found this guy who is the one that Moses pointed to through the law and that the prophets spoke about, right? So he says, I, I told him, he went and told him, I found him, I found him. The guy that Moses was talking about, the guy that the prophets were talking about, I found him. And then he said, it's Jesus from Nazareth. And then Daniel responds by asking if anything good can come from Nazareth. It's like if you, uh, somebody ran up to you super excited about something they, they found while they were shopping. And they said, hey, I, I found this amazing thing. It's, you know, it's unbelievable. You're never going to believe what it is. I found it at the, the dollar spot at Target when I first walked in the door. I don't know, if you're like me, like instantly your expectations go down. And, and yeah, I actually did Google to see what that place is. They actually call that the dollar spot. No, I didn't know that. Because the dollar's name is spot, and the spot is part of the name. But, like, you don't expect to find treasures in, in the baskets there. Like, that's, there's maybe some good deals or something. But anyway, moving on, not about party. Um, what was wrong with Nazareth that could, in the family's mind, disqualify Jesus from being who Philip said he was? Right? Nazareth was a tiny farming village, maybe a few hundred residents. I saw anywhere reported from 150 people to 500 people living in this, this village. Many of the parables of Jesus, he talked about farming and land and seeds. Like So many of his parables could have been from things that he experienced while living here in, in this farming village. It was far away from the trade routes. Right, so in the, back in the day, like the major uh, trade was done by like physically moving your products from one place to another, and there was major, basically highways, the trade routes that people traveled on to get from one trade center to another trade center. And Nazareth was far away from those trade routes. Um, nobody was trying to go through their town to sell them their wares. Um, if you're familiar with the the, the Pixar movie cars. Nazareth is like Radiator Spring, right? They build the highway and all of a sudden everybody forgets this town uh, exists because there's no reason to go through it anymore. And that's, uh, Nazareth was off the beaten path. It wasn't a part of the major flow of life in, in the region. There was a city called Sephoris, and that actually cast a large shadow over Nazareth. It was a large Roman city that had a large Jewish population. And so if you were in that area, you would probably be going to the big city rather than ending up in Nazareth for whatever reason. Nazareth was, it was far away from Jerusalem, if you look at a map. Um, it wasn't close to Jerusalem, it was, it was in the northern half, Jerusalem was way down south. And, and Jerusalem was the, the, the center of Jewish life, Jewish religious practices, Jewish government, and Nazareth was out in the wilderness far away from Jerusalem. And it's possible, I saw a few scholars as I was researching a little bit, that said it's possible that Nazareth was actually settled on purpose when people either um, returned from the exile or when um, the Babylonian exile started to happen or the Assyrian exile started to happen that people moved into this small little area apart from the rest of the world to, as, as a protective measure. They withdrew from society, withdrew from culture. So either when they returned from exile, they said we're just going to go do our own thing and so most likely it was just a few families that kind of just huddled together and made their own settlement uh, in this out of the way village. So being from Nazareth, or as they were called, being Nazarene, identified you as someone who came from a place that didn't just, it just didn't have any value in the kingdoms of this world. It didn't contribute. To, to the power structures and the, the things that were going on in the world. The reputation of Nazareth was that the residents were uneducated, they were poor, they were far from God, far from the rest of the world. Nothing significant comes from Nazareth. Nobody expected anything good to come from there. It was this out of the way, hole in the wall farming community, which honestly makes a great place if you're Mary and Joseph and Jesus and you know, the king of your country put out an order to have your kid killed. Like, this is a good place to disappear and to hide. Just kind of stay under the radar for a while. I mean, the scripture tells us that they went to Egypt, but they came back. And when they came back, they, they went to this hole in the wall place off the beaten path. It's a 
It's a good place to keep off the radar. But it's not the place you'd expect to find anybody of any importance. Expectations were low for people of Nazareth. Being a Nazarene meant you automatically had a reputation. And not necessarily a great reputation. So why then, about 120 years ago, when a growing group of people felt led by the Spirit to preach and live out personal and communal holiness, did that group get together and decide to call themselves Nazarenes? With everything that I said about Nazareth, why, like, they needed a marketing consultant, I think. Like they, of all the brand images they could have put out there, they said, we're going to go and identify ourselves with this poor, out-of-the-way place. And they did it on purpose. Why did they decide to call themselves Nazarenes? The answer to that question is a big part of the, it, it's the big reason why I'm a pastor in the Nazarene church today. I didn't grow up in the Nazarene church. In fact, my initial impression of Nazarenes was a bit weird. So I had a friend in kindergarten. His name was Brad. We played t-ball together. He lived a couple blocks from me. I could still get to his house today if I, if I wanted to. We weren't best friends, but he was a friend of mine from school. Um, and he invited me to go to BBS with him. And the Nazarene church was actually on the road that I lived on. And so I went to BBS with him. And uh, we had fun. We played games. Um, but I remember going to his house after BBS. And we were playing. We were playing down in the basement, which is like where the game room was. But they had like a... Uh, we were playing Nintendo, I think. Donkey Kong, maybe. Um, and I said, hey, man, can I use your bathroom? And he said, yeah, we've got a... Uh, a a shower over there, you just go in the shower instead of having to go upstairs. And that was really weird to me. I was, I was a really kind of by the book little kid, right? Like that didn't seem right to me. And he's like, see, I'll show you. And so he got up and he went and did his business in the shower and turned the water on for a second. And it, it was bizarre. But in my mind, as an impressionable six or seven year old, I equated Nazarenes with go to the bathroom in the shower. I know it's not fair, <laughs> but that was my initial impression. Uh, not a great start. Um, and then, fast forward years later, uh, came time for me to go to college, and I wanted to go to school in, in Chicago, because I wanted to live in the city on my own for a little while, just like an adventure. Um, but my sister was attending all of that because it was close by, and that's where she wanted to go. And my mom said, if you go to Olivet too, I'll pay like half your tuition or something. So I went to Olivet, because um, that seemed like a really good deal. And I went as an English education major, so I wanted to teach uh, high school English. I wanted, I wanted to, to teach people how to, to read things and then how to interpret and understand them. So I thought that was English education. Um, and it was there that I was introduced to holiness theology. I was introduced to the Nazarenes in a way that went beyond being in the bathroom or in the shower. Um, which was a good, it was a good education gift. Um, I felt the call to ministry while there and I just fell in love with the holiness theology, the holiness uh, movement, the optimism that, that Nazarenes had towards grace. That the Holy Spirit could radically transform a person's life so completely that they could experience it in their lives today. That, that answered some questions and some confusion that I had growing up in a more non-denominational church about what are we supposed to do with this life now that we are saved. So, <clears throat> so I started to think of myself in terms of Nazarene. And we didn't officially become Nazarene until years later. Um, and I started the whole licensing process and some ed additional education to become a pastor in church in Nazarene. But, um, I started to see the appeal of the Nazarene Church. Now, one of the classes I, I took in in my graduate program was history, mission, and poly of the Church of Nazarene, and they just talk about kind of where the church came from and why it believes what it believes. And one of the interesting things to me was that the name of the church 
was Church of the Nazarene. I mean, today we abbreviate everything, and there's, you know, Nazarene Church, or this, that, and other things. But the Church of the Nazarene was important because the of the Nazarene indicated that it belonged to the Nazarene. It was a church that was in possession of, or in uh, ownership of, the one that they call the Nazarene. It was Jesus' church. And I, I love that. Um, the church that belonged to Jesus. And, and the earliest Nazarenes I learned in this history class not only set out to serve the poor and the homeless, like that was their early mission, that was their early activity, but they deliberately set up their churches and communities uh, that had the greatest needs. So if you're a church planner today, um, they tell you probably go find a nice suburban place where you can find some, you know, educated and skilled leaders pull into your plant team, you can get some financial resources, and you can kind of get your church going. But the, the early Nazarene church said, we're going to go into the neighborhoods where people have the most needs, and then we're just going to go live amongst them. This is really what sold me on, on the Nazarene church. It's not, not just what they believed, but how they approached their ministry. Um, in Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus says some words, and they took these words to heart. From on screen. It's just uh, what Jesus told his followers in Matthew 25. I think you got that slide. Maybe. If not, it's one verse. You can do it up. <coughs> There it is. All right. So Matthew 25, verse 40, Jesus is telling his disciples, he says, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. And the Nazarenes that started the, Naz the church of the Nazarene took this to heart. They didn't just see ministry uh, to the poor and needy as charity. Well, it's a good thing that we did because they had needs and we met those needs. But they understood that serving those who are in the lowest places in our society, those who have the greatest needs, by serving them, they were, if you believe the words of Jesus as they did, serving Jesus. When they gave a hungry person food, they were giving Jesus food, because Jesus identified with these people. The head of our church is the Nazarene. And can a servant be greater than their master? Again, those are words of Jesus. They knew something. The early Nazarenes knew something. To be a Nazarene identifies one as lowly in the kingdoms of this world. But to be a Nazarene also means to be like Jesus. God could have chosen to have his son come from anywhere. God could have chosen to reveal himself through anybody but God chose Jesus of Nazareth. And the Bible tells us that not only does God care about those whom the world ignores, of course God cares about them, of course God loved them, but God chose to become them. Right? He didn't just choose to come, become and live amongst the Nazarenes, the people from Nazareth. He became one. And so Jesus isn't this rags to riches story where he started out as a poor kid from Nazareth and he, he, he mowed lawns in the summer and he worked his way up and got a trade and he worked harder than everybody else and he worked his way up through the ranks and then all of a sudden he's the king of all creation. Like he's not a rags to riches story. Jesus was never elevated in the kingdoms of this world. He was condemned. He was ridiculed. He was threatened. He was lied about. He was beaten, and eventually executed by those who evaluated it based upon the values of the kingdoms of this world. But Jesus was okay with that. Because he wasn't living according to the values and kingdoms, the values of the kingdoms of this world. That's not what he, he thought was important. He knew about another kingdom. A kingdom where the last are first. And a kingdom where the lowest are elevated to be the highest. A kingdom where the poor are blessed, the, the meek inherit everything, and the servant who serves everyone else is the greatest. 
A kingdom where fundamentally everyone is valued and loved and provided for by a loving king. Jesus knew of a kingdom where the king would wash his servants' feet rather than demand that his servants make him comfortable and take care of him. It was such a radical kingdom that Jesus knew about that this, this kingdom would, had a king who would die for his people rather than expecting his people to die for him. We put the, the next slide up. This is an important thing to get from this scripture text this morning. Jesus never stopped being from Nazareth. He simply revealed a kingdom, a way of living, in which being from Nazareth wasn't a bad thing. Being from Nazareth was a virtue. You get what I'm trying to say here? He, he didn't ever outgrow being that kid from that poor, out-of-the-way, rural farming village that everybody thought was, was worthwhile. He never, he never became Jesus not from Nazareth. He was always that person. But what he did was reveal a kingdom in which that didn't condemn you, in which you weren't valued based on how much money you had, how much education you had, how much power and influence you had. He revealed a kingdom that valued completely different things. Being a Nazarene identifies one as, as lowly in the kingdoms of this world, but blessed in the kingdom of God. Being a Nazarene means that we see the world the same way that Jesus saw the world. Being a Nazarene means that we love others the way that Jesus loves others. And being a Nazarene means not thinking about ourselves as better than those around us. Now, one of the first things I, I noticed when I was invited to come and meet with the board and talk about becoming the pastor here was the goals board out in the foyer. And that's something we're going to give some uh, attention to. I mean, COVID disrupted that. Pastoral change disrupted some of that. Right? So we'll, that, we're going to kind of bring some attention to that. Um, but one of the goals that's jumped off, actually the first goal that jumped off uh, the wall at me, was it said name change. And so I started asking questions, like, what's, what's going on with that? Like, where, where, are we going, where are we going? And what I gathered from all the various conversations that I had was we were looking more for identity. Right? There's more of a who are we as a church and how do we communicate who we are as a church to the people around us. And so in, in, this past week, we had a, a board meeting, and in my pastor's report to the board, um, I wrote these, these exact words, and I wanted to share them with you, um, because I thought they were important. The goal for the name change seems to me to be tied to developing a clarified and simplified identity, but most importantly, communicating that identity so everyone understands who we are. I know some churches are dropping denominational names, but I believe there's something special to celebrate about Nazarenes. So I suggest us communicating our identity like this. Nazarenes are people who love you like Jesus loves you. Nazarenes are people who love you like Jesus loves you. I think being known as a church that loves will be a pretty great identity. But I love the idea that when our community, our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates find out, or we tell them, that we are part of the Church of the Nazarene, that they would know that means that they are loved by us the same way that Jesus loves them. What a great witness I think that would be. And so, <clears throat> hearing today the words of Nathaniel saying, can anything good come from Nazareth? Okay. Let's answer that question by living in such a way that people know that Nazarenes are those people who love them more than Jesus loves them. Can anything good come from Nazareth? It depends on your definition of good. But we can know for sure that God comes from Nazareth. We invite the praise team to come and lead us in a time of response 
and worship. Um, I'll pray as they come. Heavenly Father, Jesus reveals many things about who you are, and there is so many things not to be overlooked in the reality that Jesus was Jesus of Nazareth. His actual location teaches us about who you are. You could have chosen your son to come as ruling kings. He could have been born into the most powerful family on earth at that time. You could have set your son into a family that had wealth and influence. You could have been born into the family of chief priests that governed the temple. You could have been born into uh, the Roman Empire and had great political and military influence. But he was born into a family that lived in Nazareth. Yeah. Father, help us to see our identity as a church of that Nazareth. Help us to embrace the kingdom that Jesus revealed and not the one that the world wants us to live in. Help us to love the world so much that the world knows how much you love. We thank you.
think my greatest goal as a pastor coming to a new church, the thing that I'd love to see happen the most, I get this question a lot, like, what do you want to see happen, what do you want to do? Was to hear people say, thank God, the Nazarenes are here. <laughs> right? I wouldn't have had Christmas without the Nazarenes. I wouldn't, don't know where I would take my kids and find people that care about my kids as much as I do if it wasn't for those Nazarenes. The world is full of darkness and difficulty. And I would love for our reputation, and it is already, but to continue to grow, to be people. That when we arrive on a scene, when they encounter us at, in wild, out <laughs> of the world, that they know that Jesus is there with them. They may not know that word. We may have to teach them who Jesus is. But we can show them. So we are a church of the Nazarene. We belong to him. He is our master, he is our example, he is our teacher, he is our king. And we follow his example. So hear these words as we prepare to dismiss today. Receive this, this blessing, this benediction as you go. Go now, listen for the voice of the Lord and follow wherever it is. Do not be dominated by anything. Allow no room within yourselves for deceit, but offer yourselves as a temple to the Holy Spirit. And may God be with you and speak through you. May Christ Jesus be one with you and raise you to life. And may the Holy Spirit dwell within you and make you holy. We go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Those with red badges are dismissed. Green and yellow hands for red.